Right. I think we're live and uh, I would like to welcome you to the Urban Transportation Panel. Uh, with me today, I have uh, unfortunately not one speaker, Imogen Pierce from Arrival, because she has fallen ill. So we send her good wishes and hope she, hopefully she is well soon again. But here today, I have uh, Darren Skilton from Innovate UK. And I have Matthias Kemp from Burial Strategy Advisors uh, in Munich. And then it's myself, Joanna Quisa. Uh, and just two words to myself. Uh, I am uh, the founder and CEO of Quisa & Co, uh, a management consultancy that works predominantly with automotive companies on innovation strategies. And I'm also a tech entrepreneur and involved in, at the moment, an automotive startup as well here in the UK. So um, that's a little bit about my background. Um, the startup I'm uh, looking at, we're looking at urban transport. So this is very, very interesting for me to listen to these two experts and what they have to say about this topic. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to ask Matthias to give a few words on himself and yeah, his views on urban or uh, urban transportation. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, Matthias Kempf. Um, I'm a partner and co-founder of Barrel Strategy Advisors. Uh, we are a strategy consulting boutique headquartered in Munich and seven offices around the world. Um, I'm with the company since 2011 and since then uh, mostly preoccupied in projects um, concerning connected vehicles, digital sales and after sales car software and predominantly shared mobility and autonomous driving. Um, before joining Barrels, um, I was a sales lead with Hilti, the tool manufacturing company, uh, for a couple of years. Um, and um, concerning my education, I'm an industrial engineer and I'm married. I have two kids. And I'm sitting here in my hometown of Munich, uh, where I was born some 40 something years ago. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. Uh, maybe you, um, we'll do a little intro to your Darren as well, and then we'll go to your presentations. Of course, yes. Thank you, Johanna. So, um, yes, I'm Darren Skilton, and I'm here today representing the Faraday Battery Challenge. So, the Faraday Battery Challenge is uh, a large UK government investment into battery technology, um, ranging from the kind of fundamental research through innovation projects and all the way up to a, a large scale up facility as well. And you get to see a bit more of that in my presentation. Um, for me, um, my background is as an automotive engineer, um, spending a lot of time at a large um, UK OEM where I focus fundamentally on thermal management. Uh, of predominantly battery electric vehicles. So um, we'll see a bit more of that in the presentation too. Okay, Matthias, over to you and let's hear your views on urban transport. Thank you. So I will make this very unspectacular from a visual point of view. I've um, prepared one slide with a couple of a uh, hypothesis that I want to bring to the table and I hope that we can catch up on them uh, later in the discussion. Mm -hmm. So the future of urban mobility um, is a simple phrase and, and but very, very complicated topic as so many different influences um, basically affect how the urban mobility markets will develop in the future. Um, so as, as our job as consultant, it is to basically try to cut through the chasm a little bit and um, identify the real important and major trends that are that are developing and um, develop the lines of thought around it. So I want to share a little bit of those with you. Um, so five hypotheses on the future of urban mobility. Um, and I want to start with number one. Um, there's a lot of fuss about um, new shared mobility concepts. So we see a lot of ride hailing and ride pooling and car sharing efforts. Um, 
So what, but what we believe is the really industrialized um, shared on-demand mobility concepts, um, they will either depend on heavy subsidies in order to scale or stay in each application until at some point in the future we'll see an AD solution available to, to, to support these, these services. Um, the reason for that is quite simple. It's the cost. Um, we see that um, there is a very, very stable mobility budget um, um, as, as a, a share of the available or disposable household income in, in basically all cities and countries. It's very stable over years. And um, what we see drastically include, including cost for housing. Um, so we just don't believe that um, with few exceptions um, that um, those, those new concepts can really grow into double digit um, mode shares um, unless the cities itself support this by, by subsidies or they get so um, cheap with the in, um, um, introduction of autonomous driving, that um, they become more affordable for large parts of the of the population. Um, what, um, the hypothesis number two is: um, most cities they identify and they know what the potential benefits of these new sh uh, shared mobility concepts could play in uh, solving the increasing issues they're facing, especially not with the urban, but I would say even more precisely in the suburban mobility tr and, and, and traffic. Um, but on the other hand, they see more and more the adverse effects and the not wanted effects of these new uh, sharing concepts. And that puts these concepts under increasing scrutiny of regulators. What do I mean by that? On the one hand, uh, we see that um, the classic, classic uh, public transit is too rigid and it's too expensive and it's too slow moving to solve the rapidly incre increasing suburban space. The suburban space grows far, four times the speed of the of the of the of the city centers, um, and and so the real issue that cities are facing today and they will, will continue to face is because of the commute traffic from the suburb uh, from suburbia into the city center and back um, on the one and, and more and more cities uh, think thought they could solve this by you know promoting uber and letting them basically run um, and their, their operations freely but um, Uber creates more traffic on the streets, not less. And so um, even cities like New York and London, they have started to regulate uh, the number of licenses and so on and so on. And we'll see this in many more cities in, in, the, in the months and years to come. Um, on the other hand, they, cities will recommand control over these new shared mobility modes both by regulating the operational modes, so they will they will basically command the areas of operation and operational times, as well as the market access and the fin financing. Um, what we see in Central Europe, but also in the UK and uh, in France and and in Spain, that uh, cities tend to basically um, declare these new shared modes as part of the public transit system. And that moves the business logic from a free market to a concession market, market logic. And uh, we'll see more and more tenders of those cities in which um, these, the, the operators can apply for certain operational areas and, uh, and they um, need to basically find the most efficient way to, um, to fulfill prescribed service levels, um, like the city um, is basically um, um, putting, them, putting them out. And um, so 
this is this is this uh, we will maybe later discuss. This has some upsides, but also significant downsides uh, for startups. But um, we'll see a, a definitely a significant increase in these type of operations. Um, so when cities take control, and we know that each individual city has highly idiosyncratic ways of monitoring and managing their, their urban transit system, we just don't believe that there is a real blockbuster business model on a global scale for foreseeable time. In Europe, we might see one. In the US, we might see one. But um, we don't think there is a one-size-fits-all model because um, the strategies that the cities pursue are just too specific and you'll find maybe a couple of archetypes that you can replicate, but it's, uh, it, it, it's really a city-specific approach is needed to, to succeed here. But on the other hand, I mean, we will see a lot of movement in the, in the area and, and these, these shared uh, on-demand modes will definitely continue to grow also substantially in the next 10 years. But unless there is really an integrated offering for the citizens living in, within the city boundaries, and this these offering is targeted at covering really all potential use cases that the that the customer um, uses his private car for, we definitely think the personal car is here to stay, um, because also the the automotive industry doesn't sleep. Um, they are working um, with great effort on developing new mo ways of basically protecting their, their, their established ownership-based business model. And um, it will be interesting to see um, which of the two approaches will in the, in the long run prevail. But um, we don't see that um, at the moment that the personal car is going to vanish like, like some studies may, may have said in the past. So that's it from my side um, as a initial as an initial um, food for thought thank you great uh, great thoughts Matthias and I will come back with because I have a few questions for you but it's interesting that you view this um, the mobility solutions basically being weaved into the fabric of some kind of uh, public transport and there's some hybrid solutions so we have lots to discuss there looking forward to it uh, so Darren Let's hear from you. Yes, and I'm just finding the right screen. Yeah. There we go. Take so, on. thank you. Yes. Um, so, I think as you already said, it's a little bit of a shame that we don't have uh, Imogen here from Arrival because yeah. we would have had a lovely link through from, um, you know, this nice view Matthias has just presented of how we see things moving in future through then to an OEM who is trying to deliver some of those solutions and perhaps Johanna you know you can talk a little bit about that with with the work that you're doing shortly but then moving through that and on to what we're doing which is ultimately trying to support that through the development of the technology which is of course batteries that is going to enable a lot of the electrification of the of the various solutions that we get here so um uh, let's let's start to sort of delve into exactly why we're doing this and of course at, at a conference about electric vehicles we don't really need too much of an introduction as to why we're doing this but you know just to set the scene very quickly on the left we see the EU CO2 targets um, in orange and the the historical emissions shown in blue there um, and of course, we see a, an, actually a, a slight uptick in terms of emissions um, from going from, 2019, uh, from 2018 to 2019, um, largely because we're firstly starting to hit a bit of a floor in terms of the capability of internal combustion engines. And you can see plotted on there um, what the, the latest Toyota Yaris hybrid um, might be able to achieve. But of course, not everybody's driving around in Toyota Yaris hybrids, they're driving around in in, in often much larger vehicles. Um, and in, in recent years, of course, the focus has also shifted to um, 
to air quality and you see a lot of um, mayors and, and uh, a lot of governments putting a big focus on this and introducing these new restrictions, you know, onto diesel cars and, and a number of other things to try and improve air quality in cities. Um, and of course, further to that, the um, the coronavirus has brought this even to, into an even sharper focus. And we've seen that actually, you know, a reduction in, that, in activity levels really can have a significant benefit to that air that people in larger cities are breathing in. So we kind of want to grab hold of that benefit and work out how we keep it for years to come. So if we're going to do this and we're going to get a lot of large, uh, sorry, a large uptake of electric vehicles, then of course all these electric vehicles need batteries. And this slide here um, attempts to demonstrate um, where we are now and, and where we think we're going. So currently we have a, a manufacturing capacity in the UK of just two gigawatt hours. That's the, the plant um, up in Sunderland um, from uh, previously owned by Nissan. And um, and the latest projection shows that by 2035, we're going to be up around 100 gigawatt hours of potential demand there, which is around five large 20 gigawatt hour um, gigafactories. Um, but of course, we have a bit of a problem here in that if the batteries are not good enough and are not meeting customer expectations, then that demand doesn't exist. And if that demand doesn't exist, then there's no real incentive for people within that ecosystem to invest their time and money into uh, improving battery technology. So it's this chicken and egg situation that the Faraday Battery Challenge is trying to address and is trying to build up that level of activity across the whole of the ecosystem um, to try and make this happen and to capture that, you know, that portion of, um, of the economy for the UK. So just to delve a little more into what it is that we're trying to focus on here, what we mean by capability, um, these targets were set out in 2017 by the UK Automotive Council um, and essentially what they say is what's written on the slide you know people want their batteries and their cars to be cheaper they want them to hold more energy and deliver that energy faster or or accept it faster through charging they want them to be safer and last longer and operate in more harsh environments and people who are developing these things want them to be predictable and of course you know we want them to be sustainable and be able to recycle a lot of the materials that are in them. And that goes across the whole of the value chain that you can see here, right from raw materials, extraction and processing, all the way through to the uh, the vehicle application and then um, second life of batteries and recycling of them. So I just wanted here to briefly um, introduce you to or remind you of the structure of the Faraday Battery Challenge. And firstly, you can see here in the middle, it's a 274 million pound investment and actually that's that's recently gone up just last week we were awarded a further 44 million pounds by the government um but as it stands here uh, in the top right you see the the application inspired research coming out of the faraday institution um which is uh w which leads nine multi-institution multidisciplinary um approximately 10 million pound each projects which are focused, which each of which are focused on solving a particular problem, and you can see those written out in those red red circles there, and um, plus a, a range of centrally managed activities such as um, industry insights or promoting the UK as a place to come and do research and making sure that the research that's being done here stays relevant to industry demands. In the bottom um, corner there, you see you see our innovation arm. You know this is our collaborative R&D projects that are working on building links throughout that entire battery ecosystem that I talked about um, within the UK there and giving businesses the confidence to invest their time and their resources uh, into developing these battery technologies. And on the left side here, you see the uh, the, the development of the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre. So this is an open access scale up facility where people can take their um, their laboratory work, you know, their gram scale and kilogram scale developments and their innovations and work out how do they scale them up so that they can be manufactured to the scale that would be needed or, or at the speed that would be needed for kind of full um, vehicle level production. So that, that's a quick whistle stop tour of the, of the challenge. And um, we really then need to ask the question, well, why is it relevant to urban mobility? And um, 
And today you will you will see a lot of these things, particularly in the context of batteries, you will see a lot of these things already um, starting to appear on the roads, you know, your kind of London buses, your Royal Mail taxis starting to become electrified. And of course, these self-driving vehicles as well. Um, and you see these things start to be introduced where it makes sense for batteries. You know, that's often in places where there are very predictable drive cycles. So you know what that vehicle's got to do every day. And it's, it's often situations where they're particularly kind of stop start and dynamic in nature. So there's a good opportunity to um, recuperate and harness a lot of that um, braking energy through uh, regen braking. But they still still are relatively limited in their application, and that can be largely due to um, bas uh, the battery capacity, but also to other challenges like, um, for example, the you know the Waymo vehicle you see in the bottom there having to operate in Phoenix in Arizona, where temperatures can exceed kind of 45 degrees C. So, what does this look like tomorrow? Well, here are just a couple of examples of um, projects that are currently underway within the Faraday Battery Challenge portfolio. Um, the first of which, um, something I just touched on, you know, thermal management, um, something that's particularly challenging for these heavy duty vehicles, these off highway vehicles, but these things that you do often see operating in urban environments. Um, and second of all, um, these uh, buses and you know other other mobility vehicles will often want to be on the go all day, and so need to take advantage of what's quickly been termed opportunity charging um, and in order to do that they need to be able to accept a high rate of charge um, whenever they get that opportunity and so here we're looking at developing new um, battery materials in this particular instance new anodes that are able to uh, to accept that charge much more quickly so um, the final thing just to say is that we have um, a particular eye on the future as well. And, uh, you know, it may seem kind of space age, but, um, you know, you need to start thinking about all of these new applications now. And there is there is this kind of continuous um, pursuit of energy and power density, you know, safety, cycle life, all of these things, which will ultimately enable these ever more demanding applications, such as the lovely looking uh, EV toll vehicle that you see there. Um, and just wanted to finish actually with um, a very quick plug, as it were, um, because because we've just been awarded this this money. Um, it means that we're going to be giving it out again and we're going to be starting to give it out next Monday. So there's a 10 million pound competition um, being launched next Monday. It's launched by our partners at the Knowledge Transfer Network, network the KTN there. And um, the main Faraday Battery Challenge competition briefing will be open to businesses, to academics, to RTOs, to local authorities. And it's very much looking at the whole spread of sectors, not just automotive, but, but you know, everything that surrounds that and will, of course, be particularly applicable to urban transportation. So if you're interested in that, then please do come along to that event. And that's right. the end from me. We've got a bit of advertisement in there as well. Yeah. There you go. Uh, thank you very much, Darren. Um, I guess I will take a little bit of Imogen's role then uh, and talk a little bit about maybe what drives from from a new um, manufacturer, as I've also worked with um, these types of brands before. So I think uh, in in we see three trends uh, that many new um, com competitors like Arrival or the Morris Commercial uh, EV that was um, that was part of launching actually last year is that we have three major trends that we look at, and the first of all is pollution. You know, governments are pushing um, to curb the emission levels and CO2 in cities, and um, that really drives, I think, with incentives, with support, they drive this EV market forward, uh, be it urban or suburban. The, um, the second thing uh, we see is um, the urbanization trend or the suburbanization trend, as Matthias also touched on, right? We see more and more uh, people moving into cities, and um, that is also true across the globe. You know, it's not just that it's Europe or America. We see this in Asia. We see this in Africa. We see this everywhere. So this puts more and more pressure into it. Cities are really becoming pressure cookers, right? And we need to find solutions that are sustainable because there are days. I loved your picture of Milan. I think everybody has at some point seen that, uh, Darren, uh, of what happened during lockdown, right? Uh, how the emission levels drop. 
but it's also simply it's a space race and um when i say space race i mean who can fit on the street you have the pedestrians you have now the scooters you have bikes you have cars how do you split that space and i think that's where um to make that space clean and to make that space pleasant will be really really important and the last thing i would like to touch on which i think imogen and arrival would be part of saying as well is e-commerce i mean uh, we see a huge rise of e-commerce and that means that we have more and more uh, deliveries happening to our door that means more and more delivery vans on our streets and i guess arrival is one of the options for that um I'm not trying to wave the flag for rival, but I'm very conscious that they were supposed to be on this panel, but uh, or any other any other uh, manufacturer in that space, right? Um, and I read somewhere a statistic that said that uh, Matthias touched on it with the increase of uh, shared mobility solutions. So today, in a city like London or New York, it's about between 60 and 80 percent of traffic are made up by delivery vans and some kind of taxi service, right? And even though private cars have a role to play, they will. Um, I think that we just need to recognize that there is an increase of that type of infrastructure traffic on the on the road. And that leads to um, itself some challenges. Um, and I listened to a panel earlier today, actually, on the future of cities. And they talked very much of the importance of public transport and how can you integrate the existing solutions into that. And I think we had Matthias touching on that as well. Um, and also the impact of government policies and how governments choose to put their money. So with that said, I would like to open up for a little bit of a discussion. And I have a few uh, questions that, um, that I would like to uh, ask you. And I think Matthias, you touched on it, but you were talking about making these solutions could be part of kind of a public transport or government supported um, to make uh, shared mobility viable. Could you expand on that? Yes. Um, when a startup is looking at a city and they say, OK, there's a high density, a lot of people move around. Um, let's let's have a look at it and let's 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 see what we can out of it. Where do they go? They go to the city center, of course. That's the first thing every every new player does. But to be quite honest, there is almost no city, unless it's very small, which has a real traffic problem in the city center. Large cities um, have a very low modal share of private car in the city center. Um, even in the motorized in motorized cities in, in Germany, if you look at the pure city center, it's hardly more than 15%. People walk, they take the bus, they take the train, they take the bike. Um, so there's this is not actually where the pro where there is a problem created. Um, so the problem is created in the suburbs people moving from the suburbs, commuting from the suburbs to the city center or going laterally from one suburb to the other. This is where you have long distances of travel and where you have a very poor public transit infrastructure. So what the pit city wants, they want these new operators to cover these non-super central areas, right? Where it is in, where it's expensive to to develop new bus lines, where it's even more expensive to develop new 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 trains or or new tra uh, train tracks and so and so on. Uh, only in China they do that to a large extent, but in Europe there are a couple of 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 of, of, um, of um, underground projects, but you can count them on your four five, five fingers. So this is where the city needs help. But this is not where the startups and the new companies are going to. So you need incentives. You need the cities need to incentivize them to do this more or less attractive to cover these less attractive areas. And this is the this is the first thing. And the second thing is they want these new um, partners to feed their existing 
high capacity mass transit um, 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 railway and, and BRT stations. So, so they particularly want you to go to a train station. And also that uh, needs needs some incentives from from the from the from the city um, to the, that the, 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 the operator is, is basically keeping up this availability and, and keeping up the the, 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 the the enough vehicles in this area to to um, to keep this this the service level in the desired in the on the desired level and that and, and then you are immediately in a situation where you're talking about subsidies where you're talking about efficiency um, and this ultimately will result in in well-known established tender models um, of which we have seen i think 12 significant ones in the in the last year and it's imp- in increasing over the over the next couple of next couple of uh, years um, and um, we, we must not make no mistake um, this new service has to be better than the car it has to be better than the car no one pays for sustainability and there has been a very very interesting uh, survey in Copenhagen, the, 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 the world capital of, of cycling, right? And they were asking the, 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 the commuters who go to work by, with, with, with the bicycle, why do they use the bicycle? And you know how many percent of the respondents said they do it because of the environment? One. One percent. And it's 70 percent because it's faster and it's 60 percent because it's cheaper. And this is this is the fact that every city needs to face. Very interesting, very interesting perspective. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Darren. Um, a bit on um, you talked about, you know, where you can apply the Faraday um, battery challenge. What new um, trends do you see? What new type of companies are you supporting through this challenge? What do you see as the new innovation coming? Sure. Um, so it, it typically, actually, it, it's not really vehicle companies, or if it is vehicle companies, it's in collaboration with uh, a battery manufacturer. So it's for, for companies, it's about um, for vehicle companies, it's about understanding how do they exploit the kind of innovations that are already coming through um, from research into innovation, and they are utilizing their um, kind of vehicular vehicular capabilities in terms of understanding what test cases are what you know what people actually want to do with their vehicles and trying to guide battery developers battery manufacturers to develop their products in such a way that they meet those um those desires of the of the vehicle users um you know there there is of course a look to the future um certainly for kind of high performance manufacturers you know there are of course a number um in the uk um but uh yeah as i say largely it's uh it's trying to meet existing applications within um within the faraday batch challenge but as i say the latest um the latest call is looking at expanding that much more widely and seeing you know how do we also meet these demands of um, the, the things that will be coming in the future, like EV toll um, vehicles, you know, flying taxis and that, and that kind of thing. Exciting, exciting future ahead. Um, this is a question to maybe both of you. Um, looking at, as we are in an automotive EV event, uh, I probably need to ask this question, but uh, what do you see as the biggest, um, what would help most with us? Uh, adoption of electric vehicles in cities you know you Darren you talked about taxis and buses but also looking at the private side what do you think is needed is it charging infrastructure what is it that makes people use electric vehicles in the cities you mean from a private or from a shared perspective maybe a little bit of both I think um, from a shared perspective it's very easy, and you see that already happening, mm-hmm. that um, the city 
mandates the operators to only use EV or zero emission vehicles. It's um, it's happening already when uh, with uh, when we when we look at um, larger orders of of bus fleets, for instance. Um, there are some cities, front runner cities like Hamburg. They have openly said they will they will never again in the future order a diesel bus. So um, the, the technology is mature enough now that um, battery electric buses, for instance, or, or fuel cell powered buses will be the norm. And uh, any manufacturer who hasn't gotten that, they, he, they will have really, really big problems. Um, and the same is true for also these new shared modes. Um, maybe for, for one year or two in pilot phases, you will see combustion engines uh, deployed, but in the long run, it, it will be EV um, because otherwise it's just not credible. And it really doesn't pay to the CO2 strategy for all of all of these cities. You can you can look basically at every larger city in Europe. They have a zero emission uh, public transit strategy until the year 2025 or 2030. So it will be completely normal um, that um, uh, ICE powered cars are banned from from public transportation. And concerning private cars. Yeah, we'll see. We'll probably see um, penalties, city taxes, um, um, zero emission zones like in London. And it would be very, very unattractive, if feasible at all, to, to move to the city center with a, with a um, non-zero uh, emission car in the next five to ten years. Mm. Hey, I... I would completely echo that sentiment. You know, I think, as you say, the um, on a on a public level, it has to be led by governments, by or, or you know, by local councils, um, as is often the way in in the town yeah. that I have here. The, the councils manage the the introduction of these vehicles in their own way, um, and often that can be in consultation with um, with residents. You know, where I live here, there's a, a kind of local, or there will be um, a referendum on um, an introduction of a green council tax that's an addition to the the local um, the local inhabitants council tax which then feeds the introduction of electric buses and more um, you know plug-in points in the city centre more places for people to keep bicycles that kind of thing so yeah you need those governments to have the oversight and the councils to have the oversight of what will work best in their individual areas but but absolutely for 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 private transport, it will certainly come down to incentives. How much is it going to cost me to run this vehicle? Yeah. Um, can I get away with with doing so? Because you know, you know, you just you you see that unfortunately the consideration given to the the greater good is not not usually stronger than the kind of in personal incentives of having you know running a cheaper vehicle. So, yeah, yeah. A question to both of you then again uh, is um, we now talked a little bit about you know um, the options with buses and so on but where do you think uh, the future is because we have a group of existing OEMs and we have a well quite a few startups coming in new building new cars new solutions very like let's say purpose built like Arrival for example or like some of the other providers uh, where do, who do you think is going to be the leaders in this when it comes to these solutions? Controversial. <laughs> well, uh, my background, as I say, is is in automotive, and you see how much of a disruptor Tesla have been. You know, they've come in, they've they've made some some products which have met a lot of people's demands, and they've expanded massively, and. You know, they have really driven engagement of some of the existing OEMs to uh, to try and make sure that they're producing products which which can compete with with Tesla's drive there. So, um, I I see it as um, these people coming in as as disrupting the industries, and then those industries, those existing players, playing catch up and trying to maintain their 
their market position because of course that's something they're not going to want to lose as you as you uh, made made a comment earlier the auto industry never sleeps you know they're not going to want to give up that that power that they already have so yeah 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 I agree and but then ultimately I'm really not completely sure I think um, there is a sweet spot where these startups can succeed you know when it comes to mass-produced um, passenger uh, cars, um, we see a lot, a lot of startups fail. Tesla is really a rare exception. Um, and they they did it so far only also with a lot of luck. Um, but it is really, really hard to mass-produce 100,000 100, of vehicles at a really high, really high quality. Manufacturing is really difficult. But um, so this is the, amazing, the biggest entry barriers. You know, we see a lot of these interesting startups with really innovative concepts, um, but we will see a lot of them vanish again. But in air mobility, the situation is a little bit different. It's, this is why I think they have a chance. Fleet sizes are much, much smaller than most OEMs still can imagine. You know, with 5,000 vehicles in the fleet, you can serve most uh, most traffic in this in a city like Munich, right? Because you can, if they are properly distributed and managed, you, they can be really, really highly utilized. And um, and this is, I think, the 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 sweet spot for for uh, companies like Rival or like for Rivian, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just being purchased by Amazon, uh, because I think. Um, with when when you when you set up a manufacturing um, uh, operation that is you know optimized to produce you know maybe maybe 10 20 vehicles a day that's feasible that's you know half automation but also a lot of manual work where you can stabilize the processes and also quality do a lot of, of manual quality checking and I think that 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 is an option uh, that, to to go to market that can pay off for these for these innovative uh, companies. And you know, when we talk to to car manufacturers, they look at the at the, at the numbers of vehicles that you need, and they say, okay, it's not interesting enough for us. It's just too small. Um, but um, not fully recognizing how much value you create out of a vehicle that is utilized in such a in such a shared manner right i mean um, the, the, you can basically increase the annual profit that you can generate out of that by the factor of 10 um, if you if you manage them properly so i think there is a good chance you will see a couple of these of these startups survive interesting yeah no um uh, there's some food for thought there. I mean, there is uh, now the competitor to Tesla, Nikola, uh, which mm -hmm. is not the same car, but you know they they have declared a bit of a competition there with taking the first name of the Nikola Tesla there. <laughs> so yeah. uh, you know you see a lot of these companies um, coming up for sure. Um, Darren, I was uh, going to ask, but you inspired my question further here. You had your um, Uber copter or the uh, the the taxi yeah. I've read lately a lot about this uh, I know there are a few startups uh, in this area that just got a huge investment in Europe so what is your view is is the car the future transport of cities or is there an alternative <laughs> uh, you're going to expose the lack of research I've done into electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles but um, I don't know what I, as somebody who loves to see these technologies come through, you know, you, you would hope that um, you might see them. I, I personally don't think that it's going to, you know, that one day we're going to all be flying around in these in these vehicles purely because of the amount of energy it takes to do so. You know, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to be making short trips and taking using so much energy to do so. So the energy system is going to have a lot of a lot of catching up to do, and we're ultimately going to. Um, find ourselves in a position through trying to decarbonize the whole of the transport sector in a in a situation where we have to balance and monitor the amount of energy that's going to each sector. We have to be clever about 
the application of certain types of energy. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense to electrify the vehicles that are small that are doing these short journeys, but it doesn't make sense in a lot of situations to electrify, you know, for example, intercontinental flights because you just require so much energy for doing so that it makes a lot more sense to use your kind of bioethanols and your your sort of lower carbon fuels. So um, I, I see the kind of EV toll, <laughs> the flying taxi as a as a, a luxury, shall we say, and not um, the ultimate future that we're all destined and heading towards. OK, completely agree. Um... When you when you look at that from a safety perspective, and you know the all the operational obstacles also um, that that comes with providing a really safe flying environment for these vehicles, um, it becomes very unlikely that it will become a super mass tr means of transit. Um, um, if if you look at the safety levels, for instance, that Uber Elevate um, is aiming to achieve. And um, you you would say, OK, their target is they want to have the same model share in a city like LA in a, of, of, of a taxi, right? Like 1%, 2% of, of all trips. They will probably lose one flying vehicle every year. Yeah. Wow. And um, nevertheless, the, even even if even if the um, even if um, the the system itself is still relatively safe and is still um, even safer than than the private car, um, these accidents they would they would draw so much attention. Um, that it will be it will be pretty hard to to sustain that. So I think there needs a lot of, of of additional thinking needs to go into the safety concepts and so on and so on. And um, there are a lot of infrastructure and surveillance infrastructure needs to be developed. Um, just you know to to have a a crowded space with all these taxis flying around over the city center, um, you really need a lot of redundancy uh, to make this uh, safe and, and workable. So I think we'll see it, but, um, and I also would love to go in one of those. Um, Lilium, one of the German startups you were talking about, they are, they are headquartered just five kilometers from where I live. So it would be very uh, would be very curious to to see them start from from their headquarters uh, in the future, but um, but I don't think it will be an everyday means of transport for the foreseeable time. Yeah. Well, well, I had to ask something about the future. So thank you. I'm also looking forward uh, to one of uh, the first flights of that. Uh, let's see when it happens. Thank you so much. We've uh, come to the end of the session. I see we have also overrun by magic three minutes. Uh, so um, I would like to thank the panelists, uh, both Matthias and Darren for taking your time. And also to our audience, I hope you have enjoyed. And I'm sure that uh, if you have any questions, you can always, uh, you know, go into the um, chat functionality that the Automotive EV offers and ask us questions. Um, but thank you guys, that was hugely inspiring. And I wish everybody a lovely afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Darren. Thank you.